Welcome everyone to part two of uh, the Taking VHL to the Clinic session. Uh, I'm Ram Srinivasan, a medical oncologist and head of the molecular cancer section of the Urologic Oncology Branch National Cancer Institute. Uh, we have four speakers scheduled for this part of this, uh, uh, this session. Uh, the first speaker is going to be Dr. Henry Timmers, Professor, Department of Internal Medicine, Radboud University, uh, Nijmegen who is going to be talking to us about the management of fear chromocytomas and paraganglioma's associated with PHM. So thank you very much for the uh, invitation. And I will uh, talk on the management of fear chromocytoma and uh, paraganglioma. I have no disclosures in relation to this talk. And I would just like to point out that uh, I will use the abbreviation PPGL to refer to both the uh, adrenal fear chromocytomas and the extra adrenal paragangliomas. And I will focus my first part of the talk on the perisurgical management and the second on the management of metastatic disease. So um, when painting the picture of uh, PPGL in the context of VHL, of course, it's important to notice that uh, the, this is very much uh, genotype dependent. Pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas occur in uh, type 2 VHL and can be the only feature in uh, 2C, in the penetrance. Uh, among carriers is estimated at 25 to 30 percent. The diagnosis is mainly made in the third decade, but they can, it can occur as early as at uh, four years of age. Um, the majority of these tumors are located in the adrenals, or actually pheochromocytomas, whereas 5 percent occurs uh, mainly in the retroperitoneum. Uh, about 15 percent are uh, bilateral or multifocal, either uh, metachronous or synchronous, and in children, this is up to 38%. And only 5%, or 5%, I should say, uh, becomes uh, metastatic. Um, we also know that these uh, tumors are uh, characterized by a noradrenergic uh, phenotype. And as opposed to other uh, genotypes, like, for example, MEN2 and NF1, there's a lack of uh, adrenaline. So when I talk about the perioperative management, it's important to notice that these tumors uh, can be dangerous. Uh, I like to compare them with volcanoes because when uh, a pheochromocytoma erupts, the catecholamines uh, can induce uh, uh, complications such as cardiomyopathy, uh, myocardial infarction, pulmonary edema, stroke, um, and other uh, complications like multi-organ failure. And uh, even in uh, tertiary referral centers like these, this study from three uh, German centers, uh, shows that uh, as many as 11% of patients uh, do develop uh, complications. It can be actually life-threatening and actually two patients died. And this usually occurs before the diagnosis is made. And these complications are also very important to consider in relation to surgery, since both the mechanical manipulation and the use of certain anesthetic drugs uh, can uh, elicit a VO crisis. Uh, fortunately, over the last uh, few decades, we have a dramatic fall in the mortality from these surgeries from 40% to about 1% to 3% and also of morbidities. Or, although I have to say that uh, the cardiovascular complication rate is still around 9%. And these, um, this improvement is due to advances in the medical management, especially introduction of the uh, ultra-adrenergic blockade. Uh, better anesthesiology and also min minimally evasive uh, surgery and of course the fact that we diagnose these tumors often in an uh, at an earlier phase uh, following an adrenal incidentaloma or for example in the context of vhl uh, in case of carrier screening so um Unfortunately, there's quite a wide range of practices worldwide when it comes to the perioperative uh, treatment. And uh, basically, uh, these recommendations are all uh, more or less expert-based. Uh, we recently published a overview paper on the perioperative management. And uh, this is actually, this paper was along the lines of the previously published uh, Endocrine Society guideline on pheochromocytoma. I think the most important goals of pre-surgical management are to prevent the uh, uh, anesthesia and surgery-induced catecholamine storm and its consequences, its complications, but also to uh, prevent preoperative complications, to relieve the patient of symptoms, and also to preoperatively control hemodynamics, volume status, uh, glucose metabolism, and bowel motility. 
system. I will definitely not go into detail, but just to give you an impression on what the approach is, is that in general we start with a alpha blocker uh, at least 7 to 14 days prior to the surgery. And if necessary, we will add on a, a calcium antagonist. A beta blocker is added uh, in order to control tachycardia. Uh, and also, this is in parallel to uh, sodium loading to restore intravenous volume depletion and also to prevent preoperative orthostatic hypotension and postoperative uh, hypotension. So, uh, the drugs that are most uh, often used when it comes to alpha adrenergic receptor blockers are uh, doxazosin. Doxazosin is an alpha 1 selective uh, adrenergic blocker, and also phenoxybenzamine. This is actually an irreversible blocker of both alpha 1 and alpha 2 uh, blockers. So theoretically, it would be more potent. Um, and in order to investigate the optimal way of uh, alpha blockade prior to uh, surgery, uh, actually in the Netherlands, the first uh, trial ever on preoperative treatment was done. This was coordinated by Michiel Kerstens from uh, Groningen. This was a national study in which we all participated and we compared the efficacy of phenoxybenzamine and uh, doxazosin in a randomized uh, fashion. I won't go into the details, but I will just mention the main outcomes. Uh, this paper was actually published in GCEM this year. So um, we um, uh, investigated 144 uh, patients who were followed uh, 30, year, 30 days uh, post-operatively, and uh, overall no mortality uh, was observed. Also, we found a cardiovascular complication rate of uh, uh, 8%. And this was specifically in the group with the highest hemodynamic uh, instability. Uh, when, it, when we compare phenoxybenzamine to doxazosin, uh, the primary endpoint was the cumulative time outside the desired blood pressure ranges. And this was actually not different between the two groups. There were also no uh, differences in side effects, complications, and in post-operative hypotension. Uh, however, there was more intraoperative hemodynamic instability with doxazosin, uh, as may be expected, um, because, uh, and this was uh, illustrated by a higher need of vasodilator drugs uh, administered by the anesthesiologist. Postoperative hypertension occurred in about 40%, and vasopressors were needed in 33%, um, and side effects were uh, transient and uh, of a low grade. So, to, me, to my opinion, unfortunately, there has been some debate on whether alpha adrenergic blockade should be given prior to surgery at all. And this uh, discussion was fueled by Waltz. He is a high uh, volume adrenalectomy surgeon from Essen, Germany, and they published a retrospective analysis um, where they compared uh, 110 patients who did receive preoperative blockade. Uh, with 167 who did not receive blockade. They did receive it during the surgery, but not prior to the surgery. There's, it's a retrospective analysis. Uh, we don't know why certain patients were selected to, to receive or not receive blockade, but anyway, they didn't find any differences in the maximum systolic blood pressure and episodes over as high as 250 millimeters of mercury. They observed no complications, which is actually very striking. Uh, and I, um, and uh, also we do not have any information on the uh, use of vasoactive drugs and the uh, fluids uh, that were required. And these we know are very determ uh, important determinants of outcome of surgery in general. And we do not, not know the quality of life of the anesthesiologist, so to say. It's always difficult to kind of uh, translate the results from a high volume center like this uh, to make it as a general uh, application. Um, so, Regarding this debate, do we need a randomized trial? I think it will be difficult to uh, convince an ethical committee uh, to do this trial. I also think that we will need a high number of patients, at least a thousand, to detect a meaningful, meaningful decrease in complications. And then in the end, I think we will end up not knowing uh, which uh, patients are suitable not to receive uh, alpha blockers. So I think it's going to be difficult. Um, apart from the drugs that we should administer, 
um, I think it's also important to take into account the drugs that should be avoided in these patients because these drugs, like for example, certain antidepressants and anti-emetics, uh, uh, should be avoided because they can elicit a catecholamine storm because they interfere with catecholamine metabolism uh, or catecholamine synthesis or uh, release. Regarding the surgical management, um, also for the adrenalectomies, the scopic adrenalectomy is nowadays, uh, let's say, the mainstay, I would say. Uh, usually in our, at our center, this happens through the posterior retroperitoneoscopic way. Alternative can be done transperitoneally. Um, and uh, especially our surgeons would select a patient with a very high BMI and large tumors uh, for this approach. And of course, for large and invasive tumors, the open adrenalectomy is still a option. Um, other improvements in the surgery are, uh, or, um, uh, are the uh, use of a robot-assisted adrenalectomy, like we heard with the kidneys just, just before, uh, and also uh, the possibility of a single port approach performed in Essen. So when talking about a, a hereditary disorder like VHL uh, with the chance of developing a bilateral VO, it's always important to think about partial cortical sparing adrenalectomy. I think the most solid data come from a recent a retrospect, uh, a re recent uh, analysis where uh, over 600 uh, patients were investigated with bilateral VO, about half were planned as a partial adrenalectomy, uh, and the surgeons actually uh, uh, reported a, a technical success in 77% after the surgery. After uh, follow-up, however, uh, 24 of these 24 percent of these patients, uh, in fact, did develop adrenal insufficiency, and 13 percent developed a local recurrence. Two percent developed metastatic disease, but this was uh, uh, told not to be related to the partial adrenalectomy. And it was, uh, by the way, one third of the patients involved in this study uh, had a uh, VHL mutation. And it was concluded by the authors that cortical sparing adrenalectomy should be considered in all patients with hereditary VO as long as it is uh, below five centimeters. Uh, I tend to agree, but there is a problem, I think, with the patients who present with a, a unilateral uh, pheochromocytoma because the chance that they will develop metachronously a second uh, pheochromocytoma will is estimated at about 11%. And we have to weigh that against the chance of developing, uh, let's say, a local recurrence, for example. Regarding a metastatic pheochromocytoma uh, uh, and paraganglioma, um, we have to realize that uh, all of these tumors are potentially malignant and we do not have any reliable histological or molecular uh, markers. And met metastases are actually defined by lesions in tissues where the chromophane cells are normally absent, such, such as the lymph nodes, the bone, the liver, and the lung. They're usually indolent tumors, and the five-year survival is about 40 to 74 percent. And um, as opposed to VHL, SDHB germline mutations are a very strong predictor of metastatic disease and a bad prognosis. Regarding the management of uh, metastatic paraganglioma, uh, I think there's two parts, and that's the management of catecholamine use symptoms and complications, again, mainly with adrenergic uh, blockade. And of course, there is the treatment of uh, a metastatic disease itself. I think it really depends on whether, uh, whether the disease is slowly progressive or rapidly progressive in what you would choose. Uh, in general, slowly progressive disease is treated by radionuclide uh, treatments, uh, like, for example, MIBG or lutetium uh, dotatate, whereas rapid progression is usually uh, tackled uh, by, uh, or can be tackled by uh, uh, chemotherapy with the classical scheme of uh, cyclophosphamide, mite, uh, vincristin, and dark carbazine. Um, and this can actually be followed by, followed by monotherapy with docarbazine or temozolomide. And then, of course, there's the box of targeted treatment. So let's see what we know in FIO. I'm sorry for this very busy slide. This comes from the TCG, TCGA study on pheochromocytoma, and it shows how uh, the molecular classification of paragangliomas is what it looks like. So basically, we have three clusters. Um, there's the pseudo-hypoxia cluster, the kinase signaling cluster, and the wind signaling cluster. And obviously, VHL is in the pseudo-hypoxia uh, cluster. 
with a central role for HIF, like we hear uh, much about during this very interesting symposium. And if we look at the molecular targets in VHL, and I'm just going to uh, refer to this in when, it, when it is relevant uh, to FIO, um, I think the most important, the most promising targets are uh, HIF2 alpha, like we heard, uh, and also the VGF uh, uh, system. And we have different drugs to target these. Um, so what do we know with, what is our experience with these drugs in pheochromocytoma? Well, we still are waiting for the first data uh, in humans when it comes to the use of HIF2 alpha inhibitors. Um, we do have information on the use of tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitors with sunitinib and cabozantinib being the most promising ones, with which we have the most, uh, most experience. Pazopanib and axitinib have been discarded in this matter. What is our experience with sunitinib? That's actually the, the drug we have the most experience on. Um, the, this is a publication from Kim and from MD, MD Anderson, a case of a 32-year-old female with uh, metastatic uh, virochromosatoma, VHL-related, and also renal cell carcinoma and a PNET. Uh, and with a half a year of treatment, there's actually a decrease uh, of the tumors and a clinical improvement, although at the cost of an initial peak of catecholamine metabolites, probably due to necrosis of the uh, virochromosatoma. We have um, a little bit more information uh, uh, in this uh, small studies like this. Uh, this is a study of 17 patients. Uh, three of them uh, needed to quit the uh, sunitinib because of side effects, and the other 14 were followed. We have variable response. More than half do have a favorable either radiographic or clinical response, or both, that lasts for several months to uh, two years as a maximum. So currently we are kind of finishing up in Europe with the first randomized study in malignant progressive pheochromocytoma and uh, paraganglioma, uh, where we are comparing sunitinib versus uh, placebo. This uh, trial has been running for quite some years now, but it's coming to the end. The uh, final follow-up is actually being done. Um, and then we will have more information also across different genotypes underlying the metastatic VO and paraganglioma on the use of sunitinib and when it is um, feasible to use. Um, coming back to these, uh, the management of uh, metastatic VO, uh, coming back to the box on uh, targeted treatment, I think we now know that there is a role for tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, mainly sunitinib. Uh, and carbozantinib, and in the future, maybe we will be able to also use HIF2 inhibitors, and in case of other, uh, let's say, clusters uh, of molecular classification, other, uh, let's say, um, targeted treatment. So I would like to conclude with a recommendation from the Endocrine uh, Clinical Practice Guideline on Paraganglioma by Jacques Lenders, uh, led by Jacques Lenders, uh, and that is the recommendation that patients with PPGL should be evaluated and treated by multidisciplinary teams at centers with appropriate expertise to ensure a favorable outcome. And I think this is especially true in VHL, uh, where it can be actually quite complicated dealing with different, uh, uh, let's say, conditions uh, at the time. I would like to thank the audience, you, for your attention, and also my colleagues at the Rappout Adrenal Center in Nijmegen in the Netherlands, and the uh, patient platforms, especially in uh, regards to the adrenal gland uh, in the Netherlands that we work with uh, very happily. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Timmers. Uh, I think we may have time for a question or two. Uh, seeing a couple of questions, I'm trying to tr interpret what exactly is being asked for. I'm going to do my best and try to convey the question to you as best as I understand this. Uh, I think this uh, person is asking for uh, your opinion on the current screening guidelines that Dr. Daniels presented uh, with regard to PGL, uh, what your views are. Yeah, well, uh, regarding the screening, I'm happy to comment, but I know that tomorrow there will be a talk on the screening, actually uh, focusing on that uh, subject uh, regarding the biochemical diagnosis. Um, so um, 
from uh, from what I learned from literature is that the earliest cases of pheochromocytoma have been uh, published uh, in patients uh, as young as four years old. I noticed in the guideline that uh, this, some kind of screening, especially with physical examination, already starts at age uh, two, and that at age, I think it was five, if I'm correct, uh, first biochemical screening is, is started. So I think it's, it's, uh, it would be appropriate. There's always a balance of over-screening and, uh, and, of course, being on the safe side. Thank you. Um, Follow-up question. Uh, do you think clinical VHL subtyping is relevant at all, uh, particularly with regard to screening recommendations? Excuse me, could you repeat the question? Uh, what are your views on clinical subtyping of VHL? And do you think that should be taken into account uh, when well, you determine the screening uh, you know, uh, yeah. of a given patient? I think it's always difficult. To be honest, um, uh, I don't dare to leave out a part of the screening uh, when, the, uh, when, starting, when the starting point is a certain uh, mutation. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I always... You know, take into account a small possibility of still the development of a of a pheochromocytoma. Thank you, thank you. Uh, question from Dr. Liu: uh, Are there preclinical models to evaluate uh, treatment for agangliomas? Yeah, it's 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 quite difficult to have, uh, let's say, valuable uh, uh, models. Uh, these tumors are especially very difficult to grow. They are of neurogenic origin, or they're so in the petri dish. They they really uh, are very uh, difficult to control, and they lose their characteristics. Uh, so it's it's really difficult to have an an, an in vitro model. There are, however, certain. Uh, uh, cell models for pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, but I have to say that they are mainly based on neurofibromatosis-derived uh, 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 tumors, uh, so rat models and, and mouse models. There are some uh, models for SDHB, but uh, I'm not aware of specifically a VHL-related uh, pheochromocytoma um, model, uh, um, either um, in vivo or in vitro, but maybe someone in the audience knows better than I do. Thank you.